help me welcome Father Cash from Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you, brother. Here. Peter, here, you, this is yours. I don't know where I'll drop it. No, no. Thank you very much, Peter. No, it's a great joy to be with you. And uh, the Ericsons are very dear friends. Again, Matthias is my godson. And it's a great joy always to visit the great state of Wisconsin. Were I not a Dominican, I would live here. I love the state. I do. It's not ironic. That's serious. But uh, Dominicans, we're the order of preachers, which is why after our names, you see OP. That's what it stands for, order of preachers. And we were founded in the 13th century by St. Dominic. So that's why we're nicknamed Dominicans. And our charism is preaching, and our motto is truth. Now today, preaching isn't a big deal because every priest preaches, but in the Middle Ages, as you know, bishops alone were allowed to preach. Your parish priest was not allowed because he didn't know enough. They didn't have a formalized seminary education system. And this was leading to many faithful Catholics being distracted by non-Catholic preachers of various heretical sects. And finally, St. Dominic and was commissioned by the Pope to found an order of preachers. So we were the first priests that would preach. And we joke now that every priest wants to be a Dominican because that's why they're all preaching now. <laughs> and so our uh, charism then has continued. We do several, we have many saints, St. Saint Thomas Aquinas, St. Albert the Great, Catherine of Siena was a Dominican sister. The Dominicans are always the Pope's personal scholar or theologian. That's been the case since St. Dominic. So today there's a Polish Dominican that lives in the papal apartments and this is an advisor. And, uh, and it's my joy then to be with you uh, and not to be for a few couple of days in Washington, D.C. where my usual preaching and teaching takes place. And what we want to do this evening is to look at, you've heard the title of the talk was uh, The Only Three Questions, The Search for real spirituality, and what I will propose to you by the end uh, in an argument, argument is that in the end there are only fundamentally three questions that any person can ask. Fundamentally only three. Now of course there are many questions that people ask in their life, but in terms of three life questions, you fall into one of these three questions. And why is question itself important? It is because of this. There is no such thing as a non-intellectual spirituality. There is no such thing as a non-intellectual spirituality. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's start by what it does not mean. It does not mean that all people who are spiritual are intellectualists or intellectuals. They wear the tweed jacket, they sip the bourbon, smoke the cigars, and have lots of deep conversations. That's not what we mean. Rather, what we mean by intellectual is that your intellect, your spirit, your soul are all the same, are all connected. And so if you and I have a spiritual life, which everyone does, why? Because they have a spiritual life part of them, their soul, their spirit. What is their spirit? It is their intellect. So whenever, ever, ever, whenever anyone talks about their spirituality, they are talking about how their soul operates, and their soul operates, acts, engages reality through the intellect. So there is no such thing as a non-intellectual spirituality because everyone's spirit is their intellect. And that's where the question comes to the fore. How does the intellect, the mind, we mean the spirit, the intellect here, not just in terms of the brain, that's the organ of the mind, but we mean how do, does the spiritual power of understanding, knowledge, and love operate? It starts and it advances through questions. I have uh, four younger sisters and many nieces and nephews, and you see this, or some, you know, you, many of you are parents, young children, what is that? That's a tree. What is that? That's ice cream. What is that? That's broccoli. Their life choices change based upon all of those things. They immediately, through that question, 
through that encounter, what is this ice cream? That's a different experience that shapes them, even in their infantile decisions, from what is that, broccoli. The whole of our life, the whole of our intellect, the whole of our spirit, and therefore the whole of our spirituality is shaped by the questions we asked. And whether or not we realize it, all of us have a life question that governs us, that directs us. And so what I want to do now is to look at the three fundamental questions that every person lives by, one of them at least. And we will see very clearly the question that the saint, that the happy person, that the virtuous person lives by. We will see the question that's in the middle, that leads to many complications and difficulties and infelicities. And then finally, we will see the worst question, the question of secularism that has continued to emerge and grow in prominence in our own period. And very interestingly, this question, there were the three questions, are all found in the texts of the Bible. You, you didn't have to bring your Bible. I have these pages in front of me are just print-offs from the scriptures. But they're all contained there, because these questions are not new. We've been living by them from the beginning. And in order to accentuate the dis difference between the first two questions of our three, let us go to the first chapter of St. Luke's Gospel and discover and try to discern, figure out, What's happening in a very peculiar paradox? What do we have in Luke chapter 1? Early on, in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, we encounter the man Zechariah, a righteous man, a good guy, and his wife Elizabeth. And what do we discover? That they are very old and have never had any children. We know this story. And Zechariah goes into the Holy of Holies to perform the acts uh, that are proper to a priest, which he is. And in the middle of this, we know what happens. The angel Gabriel comes and says to him, you will have a son. And what it happens, it says, Zechariah, this is literally in the text, verse 12 of chapter 1 of Luke. It says, Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel. But the angel said to him, do not fear, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall name him John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, etc., etc. What is happening? Zechariah doing priestly things in the Old Covenant. The angel Gabriel, angel means messenger, comes from God with a message. What is the message? You will have a son against all odds. Your wife is old and barren. You are very old. And this, his presence, your son's presence, will bring joy to you and your family and ultimately to all of the world and all of history. And what does Zechariah do in response? He asks a question. Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? First question. Zechariah asks, how shall I know? There's our first question. How shall I know this? And he continues, for I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. So pause here. Zechariah receives a message from God through his messenger, the angel, and he stands back. He's afraid. He's troubled. How is this going to happen? He says, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. This is not unreasonable. Most of the time, very aged people do not have children, especially when they haven't been able to have children when they were younger. This is not, Zachariah, you are not crazy. But the angel answers him. We know what happens. He says, I am Gabriel, who stand in the presence of God, the angel, 
And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you the good news, the gospel. And behold, the angel continues, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things come to pass because you did not believe the words that I spoke to you. So again, the lineup. Angel comes, Zachariah. Zachariah is troubled, afraid. This appearance of an angelic being is very startling. Even more so, his message, you will have a son. And Zachariah asks a question. How shall I know? Gabriel is very displeased and says, you will be punished, you will be muted, unable to speak until the day that this happens. Again, we know this story. But that's the first question, the Zachariah question, or as I call it, the Zacharian question. Now, we go just a few verses after this incident to another incident, same chapter, same book of the, God, the Bible, a matter of inches lower on the page of your biblical text, this same angel comes to another person. We know this also. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And then the Bible says, literally, this is the RSV, Revised Standard Version, but she was greatly troubled. So look at the lineup so far. A same angel. The response of both Zechariah and Mary is to be troubled. And it's also a similar message. Do not be afraid, Mary, the angel continues, for you have found favor with God. What is, the, what is he saying to Mary? Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, another question. How shall this be? Second question. Just to reiterate, we see it, but just to go through it one more time. Angel Gabriel, both scenarios, comes with very similar messages, unusual circumstances, old age for Zechariah, virginity for Mary. You will have a son. They are both very troubled. They both ask a question because this is a very perplexing presentation, annunciation, Zechariah is punished with muteness. The, the, the angel is very unhappy and displeased with his question. And what happens with Our Lady? How shall this be? Mary asks her question, since I have no husband. And the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So we can ask, what led to the difference of response from the angel? Everything lines up between Zachariah's encounter with Gabriel and Mary, our lady's encounter with Gabriel, appearance, the message, child, troubled. They ask a question, what's going on? Gabriel punishes Zechariah. He is muted, silenced. The angel is displeased. Mary goes on very, you are highly favored. You are amongst all God's creatures, highest to be praised. 
the angel is happy with Mary. What led to the divergence between these two responses? Was the angel merely having a bad day? <laughs> Traffic in heaven was tight. He was trying to make it Zachary. He just caught the angel Gabriel whenever he was frustrated. Of course not. Angels don't have emotions. That requires a bodily uh, constitution. Angels are pure spirits. Was it that he was... Uh, just he liked Mary better. She was kinder. She was more attentive. She was more docile. No, because the angel never speaks by himself or on his own account. He's the messenger of God. He is the voice piece of God. God is speaking through the angel to both Zachariah and Mary. And so when we see that the angel is displeased with Zachariah and not displeased with Mary, and in fact, very pleased with Mary, this isn't the angel's mercurial or capricious nature, this is God being displeased with Zechariah and pleased with Mary. The only essential difference, when you look at the structure of the narrative between Zechariah and Our Lady in the same Gospel, Luke, the same chapter, what is the only difference? It is the difference between questions. Initial glance, an initial regard between what Zechariah and what Our Lady asked would seem to equate them. They're asking the same thing. What's going on? But further reflection, particularly for those of you, and I know we have some savants in our midst who are aware of the history of ideas, these questions exemplify the history of Western philosophy. Starting with Zechariah. How shall I know? Notice even in the grammatical structure of the question, the term of Zachariah's question is what? It's in his knowledge. You're telling me something, and I'm open to it being true. I'm open to it happening. I'm open to this reality that you promise actually being the case. But how shall I know this? How shall my mind, my knowledge, my reflection, my contemplation, how can you get that into here? And if we look at the history of Western philosophy, of course, what is the period where questions of knowledge were the supreme? It's the European Enlightenment. Figures that you studied or slept through the classes in college, you need to take intro to philosophy. The most famous, of course, is Rene Descartes. What's he famous for? He's famous for exactly asking this question. How shall I know? How do I know I exist? How do I know you exist? Maybe my senses can't be trusted. We know mirages are possible. Maybe I'm in the matrix. He asked it before the movie. He really did. <laughs> and his entire project, and then his Descendants in terms of the great philosophers, Immanuel Kant, David Hume, William Barclay, all of the philosophers of the European Enlightenment were searching to understand how we know. Their concern was in the human person and the human person's capacity, the possibility of having real knowledge. So if we illustrate this, we could put the human person here, and then we have reality out here. Anything real. What is the case? Their question was this. Their direction was this. How can I get that into here? Because is it not possible that I am completely separated off, bifurcated from, isolated, quarantined away from, all of reality, how shall I know? The emphasis in the Zacharian question is the enlightenment question. We're open to reality being out there. God might exist. Law, natural law might exist. But how do I know it? Conversely, Our Lady's question works in the opposite direction. What is the emphasis in her question? She doesn't hate knowledge. She's not an anti-intellectual in the sense that she thinks the intellect should not know anything. 
How do we know that she's not against the intellect knowing something? Because she's asking a question. The only reason you ask a question is to learn. But where is the accent mark for her contemplation? It's not in her mind, in her own categories, her presuppositions, the limitations, the restrictions of epistemology, human cognition, her own ideational structure. She herself is not the center of knowledge and of reality. What? The center for Our Lady, like for classical philosophy, is in reality itself. For Mary, Mary is asking, how shall this be? It's a question of being, reality, not thought. Zachariah's play, they're both working with the same parts. We have a person who can know and love and interact. Zachariah places the emphasis here. Our Lady is focused on being, on reality. How shall this be? They're working in opposite directions. And so again, for those of you that are philosophically astute and familiar, know that how shall I know? That's the question of the Enlightenment. Zachariah is kind of a proto-Enlightenment philosopher. And Mary, her question is the ultimate question of who? Aristotle. Aristotle said, we're interested in reality. The mind goes outward. It can know what is really the case. And what is truth? Truth is not the correspondence of reality to my mind, my perspective, my experience. No, what is truth? Truth is, he defined it thus. This is the realist definition of truth. It's what? The correspondence of my mind to reality. So when I encounter a rock, and I understand what a rock is, its shape, its content, its meaning, its essence, or its form, when my mind knows that, I have in my mind, in a spiritual way, the nature, the content, the shape, the essence, the form of the rock. My mind takes on the shape of the rock. Being and reality shapes me. So we're struck immediately with two diametrically opposed directions for living according to the questions. Zechariah is attempting to encounter God and understand what God tells us according to an enlightenment question where he is looking out through the cage of his mind and he says, this could be real, I really hope it is, but I, the standard, the reference point, the ultimate basis for my engagement with reality will be Reality has to fit my preconceptions. So in a word, Zachariah's problem and the reason why he is ultimately muted is because Zachariah's knowledge and his question and therefore his spirituality starts in himself. If you start in your mind, you never get out of your mind. Because until you start with reality, real trees, real squirrels, real grass, real ice cream, real people, you will not have any content, any ideas that correspond to reality that you can engage reality in light of. And this is why he's muted. We often think that God punishes us the way that a parent might give a time out. It's like when I was a child, you know, maybe this might have happened or not. You know, when I was a young, you know, three, four-year-old, and my poor sister walked by innocently, she's very sweet, and I would give her, you know, a certain fraternal slap, and my mother would see this and say, immediately, you're going to have a timeout. That's a just punishment. I needed to learn, you know, you don't slap women and your sisters, etc. I'm very happy that my parents were such virtuous parents, and I learned that. However, there's not really a real direct connection between that immoral act, sister slapping, and the punishment. And that's okay. That can work. But for God, God never works like that. All of his punishments are not where he says, oh, you have really enraged me, Zachariah, and you've got it coming. Let me reach into my uh, 
you know, bag of punishments and find a really good one. Okay, death immediately, that's a little strong, you know, uh, you know, warts, that's a little too weak. Ah, mutedness, here you go. <laughs> that's not what's happening here. The punishments that God distributes are more analogous to if I were to walk to the top of this building onto the roof and then jump off of it and break my leg. Is that a punishment of that immoral act? That is, that's stupid, that's impractical, that's imprudent. It's a sin to jump off of a building without any you know, ex- ag- aggravating uh, circumstances. That's against right reason. Contra rectum rationem, as the Latin would be. It's against right reason. That's a sin. And it is true that breaking your leg is a punishment. But it's not, I don't think there is, I writhe with pain, that God, the moment I left the rooftop and started falling through the air, that he says, I'm going to punish Father Cuddy by giving him a punishment that he won't forget for a while. No, this is the natural result of what happens by this particular sin. God's punishments follow from as consequences, natural consequences, or supernatural consequences, of disordered sinful behavior. And so when we look at the punishment that comes to Zechariah, that also reveals to us the gravity of, the nature of his disorder. What's his punishment? He can't speak. Why would someone not be able to speak? What is happening if someone is not able to speak? Well, what's the nature of speech? Speech is when we formulate in our minds and in our hearts ideas, propositions, words, phrases, sentences, even paragraphs, some people pages, and you express them verbally. The pre-requirements for speech are you have something within you that you can express. If we know nothing, we are unable to speak and communicate because we have nothing to communicate. And this is what Zachariah's punishment reveals. Zachariah, if you start in your mind in the relation to God, if you start in your soul in the relation to God, if you start in yourself, that's the underlying principle, yourself, your mind, you yourself, in relation to God and in relation to reality, you have literally nothing to say because you're isolated from all reality and from all people who exist in reality. Beautifully, what is the moment, we won't read it, but the moment when Zachariah regains his ability to speak? Remember, whenever Elizabeth and her friends are trying to determine what to name the child, because she does get pregnant, the angel was telling the truth about reality. And Zachariah is sitting there in the corner very mutedly. And she says, we're going to call him John. And their friends say, no, that's ridiculous. Name him after his father or after the uncle or after that famous people we see on you know, the first century television shows or whatever they were thinking of proposing. And Zechariah writes down, his name will be John. And instantly, he is able to speak. What does that show? It says, now, Zechariah, you are finally living outside of your mind. You have searched for and received an encounter with reality that was given to you, that was revealed to you. You are now able to communicate because you're no longer starting within yourself. Our Lady starts with reality. How shall this be? That's the contemplative question. Contemplatives are not the ones that know all the answers. They're the ones that encounter reality, whether it be natural, miracles of science, physics, quantum mechanics, very bizarre things. What's going on here? We're encountering real things, real being, real phenomena. I want to know what this means, what's happening. When God reveals something supernaturally, we receive it. Mary is receiving with her soul. Wow, okay, I am going to be a mother. How is this going to happen? 
Let me contemplate, let me comprehend, meditating all these things that she does in her heart. I want to grasp, to be conformed to, in my mind, in my soul, in my spirit, to the reality. She doesn't start with herself. She starts with her reality and discovers herself in reality. Zechariah, the opposite, tries to start in himself hoping that reality is out there, but he ends up being stuck in himself. Because if you start in yourself, you never get out of yourself, and you never encounter the reality, which is beyond yourself. Because you yourself and we ourselves are ordered outwardly. Every child shows this from the first moment. They're touching, feeling, tasting, smelling, the human person's outward directed. The enlightenment question of knowledge, how shall I know, as the ultimate life question, that is a disordered question that led throughout history and in philosophy and in theology to much sadness and frustration. Now, we move then from the first question, the enlightenment question, Zachariah's question, to Our Lady's question, the realist question, how shall this be? Let us look now at the worst question, the question of secularism, the question that is shaping the world and culture more and more. And then in conclusion, we'll put them together and look at how the different spiritual effects for our lives that follow from these. The third question that anyone lives by appears in the third chapter of the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Again, well known to all of us. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 starts thus. Now the serpent was more subtle, shrewd, than any other wild creature the Lord had made. Very interesting. Genesis 1 starts with a description of the shrewdness of the serpent, the devil. This is a clever person, being. This is an intelligent being. And what does he do? He comes to the woman and says, Did God really say? Third question, did God really say, whoop, say, there we go. Notice this, Zachariah's question is open to reality. There might, it's like the X-Files, the truth might be out there somewhere. But my question is, how am I going to know this? I'm starting in myself. I'm in the imagined spiritual prison of myself. Unless I'm able, these propositions, these beings, these experiences are able to be proportioned to me, I'm distant. Mary starts with reality. She contemplates from within reality. She lives with real being and real truth and real love and real friendship such that the Magnificat, her presence, her contemplation and her very identity and personhood continues until the present day to bring joy to the whole world. And now we got the serpent. Mary's living in reality. Zachariah is open to reality, but he's starting with his mind. And the serpent, he calls the whole thing into question. Hey, uh, Eve, did God really say, is there such a thing as reality at all. You've been told this by a putative, supposed, sovereign power called God. But maybe that's all an illusion. Maybe Mary and Zachariah are wrong, and there's nothing out there. He said to the woman, did God really say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Notice, to attack the Lord's creatures, 
human persons, he too asks a question. He doesn't say, hey, go eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. No, he knows how the human person works. He knows how spirituality works. He knows that the human spirit is the intellect, and you move the intellect. You guide the intellect by questions. And so he comes at them with a very subtle question to try to change their thinking and therefore their spirituality. Did God really say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman responds. She had taken her catechism seriously. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And now the serpent goes in for the kill, literally. What does he say? He says, the serpent says to the woman, you will not die. What you have bought, the narrative that you have embraced, the laws that you have received and are supposed to adhere to, are not real. You're not going to die. It's exactly the opposite of what you've been taught to think. And he continues, listen to this, For God knows, this is verse 5, that when you eat of it, the forbidden fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing knowing intellect spirit good and evil what do we have here it's a battle of intelligence of the intellects of minds and the spiritualities he says literally God knows he has knowledge about reality but he's lying to you about this reality that he made because what he knows is that if you know the truth, your eyes will be opened, you will see that this is all a facade, a mirage, none of it's true, and you will be like him because you will have the knowledge. You will determine good and evil, reality and not reality. What did God do? He made everything. He is the creator. And the serpent's saying, God's afraid that if you know what's really the inner structure of all of this and how empty it is, he's afraid that when you know that, you will be like him and you will be the creator. You will make reality your reality. You will determine good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she says, I do want to know like that. I do want to have knowledge like God. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some of it to her husband and he ate. And then what happens immediately after that? Then the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened. And what's the Bible literally say? They knew that they were naked knowledge. First thing that they notice, as soon as they have stepped outside of the eternal law, the order, the law of reality of what God knows and does, the first object of their distance, when you sin, when we sin, we step away from reality, we are isolated, we are divided. By definition, if you don't know reality, there is no connection between you and real people, real things. That's what sin does, it separates us. And notice this, as soon as they sin, as soon as they fall away, as soon as they contravene the order that God has established, there's an immediate division. But the first division is what? The division with the self. They immediately look at themselves and realize, uh-oh, there's a disconnect between my personhood, my knowledge, and my body. The first result of this disordered action is to notice the body as in some way vulnerable or a threat. First division that occurs when you begin to live according to the secularist question, did God really say, is there any reality out there? Aren't you all really gods yourself? 
is to think that you and I can make ourselves. Where are we at in the present moment? What's the biggest debate going on in all the culture? The transgenderism. We are all thinking now, no, 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 I was born in the wrong body. See, my mind, my psychology, my soul, my spirit, my mind is separated from me myself. I need to act on, to reform, to recreate what I am so that my body will now correspond to how I think. The first division of, that comes from the spirituality of the serpent's question is separation division from the self. But the division doesn't stop there. God, in his goodness, it says, we know this, comes to the garden and begins to walk. And notice this, God knows what's going on, and he loves them, he's merciful. What does the Lord do? It says, the Lord God called to the man and the woman and said to him, where are you? The devil got them off track with a question. How does God attempt to bring them back onto track? With a question. Because again, questions guide the intellect. And therefore, the intellect is the soul, the spirit, our spirituality. He knows where they are. He knows everything. It's not, okay, they were just here five minutes ago. <laughs> There's one less apple on that tree. What's happening? No, he's trying to get them by asking a question. He's trying to bring them back to himself. Lord, addressing him, here we are. Come to me. But that's not what happens. Where are you? And then Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, back to his self-division, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And then the Lord asks another question. Okay, Adam, let's try again. Come to me. That, your answer didn't relate to me. It's relating to yourself. Come back to me. So he says, who told you, Adam, that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And then what does the man do? He doesn't really answer the question. Yes, I did, Lord. What does he say? The woman that you gave me Fascinating. The next two steps, the first was a division with the self. They realize that there's some possible distinction, objectification, vulnerability, and aggressive violence possible to themselves as bodily creatures. Second thing is, now they are at odds with each other. Adam is separated, divided from his wife, and he's also divided from God because God, the woman that you gave to me, this is your fault. So Adam doubles down in the isolated independence of his question, the serpent's question, the spirituality that's happening. And so the Lord says to the woman, also, a question. What is this that you have done? And the woman says what? The serpent, he bagab, the, the, the vision continues. And the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you will be cursed above all the cattle, above all wild animals, and upon your belly you shall go. Dust you shall eat all the days of your life, etc., etc. This is what happens when we live according to the serpent's question. For a long time, up until basically this generation or so, we've been living according to the, the Enlightenment question. We're all recovering Zacharians. We'll get to that in just a second as we conclude. But now more and more, we are buying into and living by the question and therefore the spirituality of the serpent's question, which says, there is no reality. It's only what I know in my mind and what I make and what I decide. Everyone is their own relativistic God. You make your reality and I make my reality. The problem with this is that it leads explicitly to isolation. Because here's the thing, if your mind and my mind are the foundation and indeed the creators of all that's real, you're only real if you exist in my mind. 
And I'm only real if I exist in your mind. And notice what's happened in culture as well. Never has there been a time where people take it as violence against them. If you don't think in your mind that they are what they themselves think in their mind. But it makes perfect sense. If you think, that's why it's so violent. You're Catholic. You don't believe that if these different gender options are possible? No. How dare you? You're killing us. You're destroying us. It's ridiculous unless you understand that fundamentally this is the spiritual. We are killing them if they think, and if they're right, which they're not, that all of the mind is what is. If I don't exist in your mind as I exist in my mind, then you have murdered me. You have destroyed me in your own mind because the mind is all that is. Reality comes from my creativity, my establishment. I am God. Everyone is trying to be God, trying to push out on each other their own vision, their own conception of themselves, of others, and of God. That's where we're at. The problem is, is most of us, most of us here are not suffering this. We don't like this. The world, however, outside of Pewaukee, Wisconsin does. But Zachariah, and this is where we want to end in just a couple minutes, and then you're free. I want to make very clear at the end, uh, you're free to depart, but I'll stay for questions if people do have them, but that, of course, is not obligatory. Um, but most of us are recovering Zacharians because how does that happen? Zachariah, he's in between the serpent and Our Lady. Unlike the serpent... And like Mary, he's open to reality being there. The serpent says there's no reality that you don't make out there. The problem with Zachariah and Zacharian spirituality is he's like the serpent in that they start in their mind. And how do we start in our mind, in our spirituality? For most of us, the spiritual life is a conception. It's a list of laws and commandments and rules and behaviors, political voting policies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that we conform to or not. And we try, and this is very sincere, devout people. We are sincerely and profoundly and earnestly seeking to be saved, seeking to find salvation, seeking to find heaven through the categories and the ideas of our mind, which is why we love new methods of prayer. I always joke, if you want to write a best-selling Catholic book immediately, invent a new method of prayer. Perfect. Five steps to holiness in your marriage. Great. Step one, empty your mind. Okay, good. Check once. Okay, I'm emptying my mind. Dude, what's next? Step two, remember when you first met your... Okay, remember how I first met my... Why do we like check? We laugh, but we like that. Why? Because it fits into the measurement, the metric, the process of our own intellectual, conceptual things. When, why do we become discouraged when by our sins and by our failures? It's because we have in our minds the image of ourself as the saint, as the virtuous person, the perfect husband, the perfect wife, the perfect brother, sister, priest, whatever, and we fail and we lament not the distance that we have from God, but that we are failing to live up to the categories, the rule of life that we have established in our own mind. And most of us practically approach the Christian life like this. I said this a couple years ago, last year. It's the most preposterous way, but it's what we all do. We say, okay, here are my five major sins. Really bad. I hate them. I want to be with you, God. One second, God. Good. I make a resolution. Stop doing this. I'm going to work on this for the first year. Good. Four left. All right. Now this one. Now the third. Now the second. The one, last one or two are the hardest. But we think that by backing away from our sins, that we will encounter and discover the Lord. But it is impossible to find Jesus and happiness through the means of sin. That is literally the method most of us follow. Through sin, away from it, but around it. 
It's like the, the orange cones in a, in a parallel parking test. I will find the space to park called heaven by avoiding all of the sins. When salvation is nothing other than Jesus. What does Jesus mean? Savior. You don't back into heaven. You run to him. You embrace him. You're transformed by him. The saint is not the one who doesn't sin. The saint is the one who is so in love with Jesus, distracted by Jesus, that they forget about their sins. They forget to sin because they're living in him. Most of us live. The Zacharian problem is not that he asked a question. It's that he started in himself. That's the error, the starting point. What is our spirituality often? Jesus, make me. Help me. Come to me. Fulfill me. You are the spiritual coach that will give me the spiritual muscles, the virtues, the purity, the chastity, the justice, the temperance, the fortitude, all of this. I am the end. And this is why in love the Lord lets us struggle with so many sins and difficulties for so long. Because were he to let that project succeed, we could forget about it. If he helped us and allowed it, okay, Lord, we're working on this sin, done. This sin, done. Fine, gone, bye. Jesus, we did it. I'm ready. And I'm always going to be grateful to you. But now I walk the rest of my life doing what not. I'm not clinging to you. And what is heaven? Heaven is nothing other than clinging to Jesus with your whole mind and heart. The sinner who struggles, they try this. You and I try this. Lord, I want it. Help me. Oh, fell again. Lord, help. Okay, not, okay I did it again. Lord. And then each time you fall and you struggle, you run to Jesus, you run to Jesus, you run to Jesus, and finally one day he says, my beloved friend, why don't you just stay with me? Each time you... And I always heal, forgive. You get up, okay, I'm going to try to do it myself again. Why don't you remain with me? Because you see, he says, Christianity is what our lady's about. It's not about me corresponding to you, to giving your identity, your life, your plans, your conceptions, your goals. It's you coming to me and finding your identity in me as I am. And I have so much goodness, so much salvation, I give all of it to you. That is the gospel. We begin with Jesus. We move through Jesus, through the seven sacraments, towards Jesus our end. It's not beginning in ourselves. Usually, what I've done now, this is a week-long retreat that I usually preach to seminarians and religious contemplative nuns done it about a dozen times now. So I've compressed it into uh, roughly you know, an hour, 45 minute talk. Much to your church, like this should have been 30 minutes, so we'll wrap up here in a moment. But I do exhort you, this is, these are big things. I, I really pray, pray in your hearts, Lord Jesus, and you just run to him, Lord, stop, may I stop trying to be Zacharian. Stop living in my own mind, with my own concerns, my own preoccupations. Stop trying to make me Help me make you an instrument of my plans for how I envision what holiness will look like with me. Because the only way that if we start with ourselves, we can only do what we can do. And what can we do? What is the one thing only that we can take full credit for? That's our sins. And notice how this works. If you live in Zacharian spirituality, you start with yourself. Jesus, you're there. I'm open. I'm coming, but I'm going to do it. The only thing I can do by myself is disordered sins. So I try to save myself again by sins. We saw the first time I try to save myself by my own sins, backing away from them, around them, using them to navigate. But the worst and the most common is I try to save myself through the sins of others. All right. Project salvation. We look at ourselves. I am wretched. I am not lovable. I am broken. How am I to be saved? We de Lord, how am I to raise up, to elevate, to be close to you? 
I feel like I'm always being moved downward in myself with my own disorderness. And then we can turn to others and your sins and say, I, at least I don't do that. <laughs> or I don't do that. It becomes a relative goodness based upon the sins of others. The only two ways you move up in the spiritual life is either by pushing down on others to say you are higher or we are higher, or by, no matter how low you are, grabbing onto our Lord and never letting go. This is all of the problems we face in our parish, in our school, in our community, in our own heart. Our deepest insecurities come because we're trying to have Father Descartes or Father Zachariah as our spiritual director. Resolutions, plans, conceptions. When the gospel is simple, go to Jesus, cling to Jesus, love Jesus, your sin does not stop Jesus from loving you at all. Why? Because God loves you because He is good, not because you are. And God is always good. So then why is mortal sin bad? This sounds like, okay, this priest is about to say sin is not a big deal. This sounds wrong. No. Sin never stops God from loving you. The problem is, is that your sin stops you and I from loving Him. That's what's terrible. So in conclusion, in today's world, which has progressively moved past beyond Zachariah's question, maybe there's reality, but we're going to start in our mind, to now there's no reality, it's only the mind. The only answer to the problems of the world and in the home and in our hearts, the problems with us living according to a Zacharian spirituality is like Our Lady to turn to God, to reality, and say, how shall this be? Lord, I am wretched, I am miserable, I am imperfect, so is my spouse, so is my family, so is my country, so is the church, whatever it may be, she may think the thing may be, but it's you. I start with you, I hold on to you. Your name, Jesus, means Savior. It's who you are. I find my identity in you, and don't try to squeeze your identity into me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end.